COVID-19 case counts and can change decisions. Like the case of a young man, the state says COVID killed him. The coroner says it was an astonishing amount of alcohol. Public health experts know when Colorado decided to stop staying home because they've been tracking us. People make noise about public health restrictions being unconstitutional. So where are the lawsuits? Our legal expert explains why we're seeing more talk than action. Something to consider before you go camping. The feelings of the people who live nearby. And I can't tell if it's the human or the animal who's acting strangely here, but there are a lot of strange things on Next. America's top infectious disease expert says the official death count for COVID-19 is almost certainly too low. Yet there are also concerns about overcounting cases, including the concerns of a coroner in Colorado. The coroner says he has documentation to back up his claim, which means our investigative reporter Chris Vanderveen has it too. Nowhere on the man's death certificate will you find the words COVID or virus. Instead, the coroner concluded the death was the result of ethanol toxicity. For the layperson, what is that? That's al alcohol overdose, basically. Montezuma County Coroner George Devers found a blood alcohol content of 550.4 milligrams per deciliter. Yes, it's very, very high. Anything over 300, he says, can be fatal. Even though the man technically had COVID, he says he is 99.9% .9 sure alcohol killed the 35-year-old, which is why he remains stunned at the fact that even now the state health department has the death listed here. They listed it as a COVID death. Yes, the third COVID death in a county that sits at the very corner of southwestern Colorado. Which brings up another point. The very day the man's body turned up in a park in the middle of Cortez, Montezuma County commissioners sent this request to the state asking to open up businesses in a limited way, citing only 16 positive cases in the county. Monday, the state health department denied the request, saying it still has some concerns about vulnerabilities. Today, the county commissioners let out their frustrations in a meeting posted to YouTube. I mean, the state can't get away with that. They can't get away with calling something a COVID death when it isn't a COVID death. As for Devers, he'd like a better explanation from the state. I called again this morning, left another message, and I've yet to hear from him. He just wants someone, anyone, to hear him out. It'd probably be a good place for them to start, just at least call you back. I, I would think so. I would think so. Within the hour, the state health department got back to us saying that the variance wasn't officially denied. It was returned with feedback for revision. CDPHE also said that it classifies a death as COVID-19 when there is a positive test and then someone dies. That raises a ton of obvious questions, like what if somebody tests positive for COVID and then falls off a balcony or get hit by a bus, you know? We will continue to ask these questions. We want the numbers to be accurate, because you can't make good decisions, good policy, off bad numbers. Now, projections and models are one thing. I mean, they are inherently uncertain. But when it comes to counting Colorado's current and past cases, we want hard numbers. We want accurate numbers. So we will continue here to examine overcounting and undercounting. Now, we know that individual examples are going to get seized on and blown out of proportion by people who want to make sweeping statements that COVID-19 must either be vastly overcounted or vastly undercounted. So I'll say it again. We just want the numbers to be accurate because if COVID-19 is undercounted widely, well, then that could lead to decisions that unnecessarily risk lives. And if COVID-19 is overcounted widely, that could lead to decisions that could unnecessarily risk further economic damage. And even when it comes down to just a single case potentially being miscounted, you can see there in Montezuma County how even one can have a significant impact. We just want the numbers to be accurate. Colorado's public health experts are getting an idea of how many people are venturing out of the house these days because so many of us have consented to be tracked by our phones. Here's Anusha Roy. 
The Tri-County Health Department has been sifting through data from seven metro area counties and saw in mid-April people cut down how much they left their homes by 70 percent. As you might expect, that number started to drop to around 30 percent through last week. It doesn't necessarily mean people are always following the rules. They started venturing out in mid-April before safer at home models were put into effect. Tri-County suspects the weather was becoming nicer and people were becoming more restless. You know where they're not going though? the office. The data doesn't show a big increase in people traveling to go to work or using public transportation, indicating a lot of people are still working from home. They are, however, visiting the parks and recreation areas. Arapaho, Boulder, Jefferson and Douglas counties all saw doubled the number of visitors compared to the lowest points during the pandemic. Denver saw a jump too, including twice as many people going to retail stores. That's still about half of what you would typically see in Denver this time of year. And Douglas County took the lead with an 80% increase in the number of people going to retail and grocery stores in that same time frame. It also started transitioning to the safer at home model before some of the other metro area counties. So where did this information actually come from? There were three sources. It was Apple, Google, and a company called Cubex that's giving all of this money, giving this information out for free to help with the pandemic. Now, they use things like cell phone data apps and Google Maps, and it's really important to point out that what the county is getting is this big picture average number, not people's individual information. So Kyle, it's not like individuals are being tracked across this seven county area. Mm -hmm. But Adusha, I can hear people shouting at their televisions right now, how is this legal? Yeah, so we, we asked an MSU professor about this, and they basically said if you look at your location services and if you've left them on, that means companies can access their own products and their own services and ultimately access this data. It also means you can go into your settings and you can turn it off. You pick when you want to use this stuff. And the professor was saying, ultimately, it's a pretty fine line, right, of using information that can help with the pandemic, but also respecting people's privacy. If you get extra time on your hands, read the terms and conditions. Anusha, thank you. So you hear a lot to talk about how Colorado's public health rules in general are obviously unconstitutional. Well, if it's so obvious, you'd think that there would be lawsuits, right? And that there would be judges overturning those rules like Wisconsin's state Supreme Court just did. Here's what our legal analyst is telling people who want him to work on one of those lawsuits. Their chances of success, quite frankly, are next to none. I've been contacted multiple times by multiple individuals, well-meaning people who would like to have certain aspects of the safe at home or safer at home restrictions lifted. And I invariably tell them, save your money. There is no question, but those regulations will be upheld here in Colorado. Uh, that does not mean that there isn't some money to be made in bringing one of these lawsuits, even if it's unsuccessful. We told you here how a group that unsuccessfully tried to recall Democratic Governor Jared Polis is now raising money to fund such a lawsuit by an attorney who happens to be a talk radio host. Denver's financial hit from the pandemic and the resulting shutdown is worse than thought. The new projection is $226 million in lost revenue. That's $46 million worse than the last estimate. And that means that city employees, including the mayor and his staff, are going to be taking an eight-day unpaid furlough this year. Denver's chief financial officer laid out the various scenarios for recovery today. The problem is that Denver sales tax revenues got pounded. The revenue that funds things like rec centers and public services, it's down more than 16% from last year. Tourism revenue obviously fell off a cliff as well. And while the city has solid data just through March, they think it probably got worse after that. It's unfortunate to have to note that in April, the report is expected to be one of the worst months ever, both nationally and here at home. In 2009, that was the impact of the Great Recession. Um, those numbers uh, were astonishing when we experienced them. It was what I expected to be the most fin cha financially challenging period of time in my whole entire career. I could have never imagined uh, seeing the numbers that we're seeing right now. Denver does have $261 million set aside for an emergency. They're going to use some of that right now. 
Colorado has a competitive Senate race going on at the moment. And if former Governor John Hickenlooper has forgotten that for a while, he will be reminded of it tonight. Democratic primary is down to just Hickenlooper and former House Speaker Andrew Romanoff. A wide field of progressives have paired down to just the one, Romanoff, head-to-head -head with the centrist former governor. They face off tonight by remote video at a forum. It's a Zoom event hosted by Indivisible NoCo. It begins at 7 o'clock. Groups involved in politics in Boulder, groups that do not agree with each other all the time, are teaming up now because they have a shared challenge to try and get issues onto the ballot in Boulder in November. The city's forcing them to collect petition signatures in person in a pandemic. Here's politics guy Marshall Zellinger. For the price of your signature, you get a free tissue. This was an experiment. We had no idea this was going to work. For the price of your signature, you get a free pen. We're doing everything we can to uh, reduce the possibilities of transmission. And a side of hand sanitizer. None of this is a good way to get signatures because we're collecting signatures in person during a pandemic. It's curbside democracy. Three different groups are working together, trying to get three different issues on the ballot in Boulder in November. It's not ideal. It's definitely not ideal. Um, we're doing the best we can. As we told you last month, Boulder City Council decided not to change the rules and still require in-person signature collection. We're all fighting on one thing, and that's getting petitions signed. The three groups are working together, as much as you can with social distancing, to get signatures for each other's causes. I might not necessarily vote for these other initiatives, um, but I do want to see them get to the ballot. Rui's petition is to get Boulder to offer free legal help for someone facing eviction. Krista wants Boulder to make it legal for more unrelated people to live together. And Patrick wants to end Boulder's effort to start its own power company. All people need to know is where and when, and they'll show up. Patrick and Krista set up in a neighborhood park, which doesn't exactly have the same visibility as a grocery store entrance. So we sent postcards out to every registered voter in this zip code. So that was our advertising. Patrick and Rui have until June 5th to get 3,300 signatures. Krista's group has until August 5th to get 4,000. At first I was wearing the N95, right? And I think it scared people off. So now I'm wearing something a little more friendly. For next. It's the best we can do, but it's still dangerous. I'm Marshall Zellinger. A fringe conspiracy group has downplayed the pandemic until it was useful to get one of them released from jail in Colorado. Our favorite camping spots are smack dab in the small communities that other Coloradans call home. It scares me. And not just for me, but all of our friends. Some perspective from Northwest Colorado on our state's return to camping. Next. QAnon conspiracy theorists have suggested that COVID-19 is either an exaggerated hoax or an elaborate cover so they can rescue imprisoned children from tunnels beneath field hospitals built in New York City. Here in Colorado, a QAnon conspiracist in a very real jail on a very real charge of conspiracy to kidnap a child is now trying to use COVID-19 as the reason that she should be released. We have told you about the strange case of Cynthia Absa. She's from Douglas County. She's accused of plotting to kidnap her son out of foster care in an armed raid with some other QAnon believers. Absug was wanted for months before she was finally found up in Montana. She was arrested, released, then didn't show up for court. Middle of last month, the law caught up with her once again in Wyoming. Absug is being held on a whopping quarter million dollar bail. Her public defender says that that is excessive and asked a judge to let her out of jail, saying that they need to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in correctional facilities. That motion was denied. QAnon has branched out into conspiracy theories about COVID-19. I'll forgive you if you don't know that it began with a claim that President Trump is fighting a secret war against a global pedophilia ring of Democrats who drink the blood of children. Now weather.
Spring storms are rumbling across Colorado tonight. Had a few earlier this afternoon in Denver. Now they're all moving off to the eastern plains. On HG Doppler 9, we're watching these storms continuing to move from the west off to the east. Right now, just scattered light rain showers into Morgan County and then just north of Flagler. A rumble of thunder, a little bit of lightning. Tonight, we're watching those temperatures fall to the 40s as the wet weather moves out. A bit of patchy fog to start our day. And then like clockwork, here come the storms. 2, 3 o'clock, they'll be rumbling through Denver off to the east by about dinner time, 11 o'clock, they're out of the state. We do have a chance for seeing some storms turn severe with large hail, some damaging winds, and possibly even an isolated tornado. Upper 60s, low 70s for highs for eastern Colorado. And then look at early next week. The heat is on with the upper 80s. Hey, families with graduates, this is the last call for you to send in your videos to be used in our statewide celebration. We're holding our virtual graduation celebration next week for all the students who are missing out because of the pandemic. So, parents, send us your video messages of how proud you are of your grads. Teachers and professors, shoot us a video message of what you wish you could say at a graduation ceremony. And let's hear from the grads themselves. Maybe you want to shoot a little thank you to somebody who helped you along the way. Email those videos to next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext. Coloradans are once again allowed to camp at a growing number of our state parks. No, I don't want to say, no, this is our place. Don't come, but gosh, if you do, please be careful. <laughs> Something to think about before you load the tent into the Subaru. Next. Colorado's plan to slowly reopen campgrounds at state parks gives individual counties the chance to opt out. Some campgrounds open Tuesday. Others, like Steamboat Lake State Park, have not even announced an opening date. Some of the people who live up there worry about what that day might look like. We live up in Clark, Colorado. Which is north of Steamboat Springs, northwest corner of the state. Here in a couple weeks, they usually open up on Memorial Day weekend, all the campsites. With everybody that's want, wanting to come up here and start camping, we're going to see an increase in that, and then he'll be transporting more with injuries, recreational injuries or something. I'm uh, one of two paid personnel for North Route. I'm fire chief and also one of the primary EMTs say they hike in an hour or so and get hurt. Now we've got to mobilize uh, multiple resources to get that individual out. So now, now the one person is exposing at least anywhere from 12 to 20 other people. And possibly bringing that home to me who I have autoimmune disease. I'm really surprised that we got this far without it coming into our household with you know his job it scares me i mean i get it i get that people would want to come here after being locked up and everything and it's beautiful um and we don't own it <laughs> of course i don't want to say no this is our place don't come but gosh if you do please be careful <laughs> If you have reservations about camping during a pandemic, good. You're going to need reservations. And the state is also asking that people gas up and buy all of their meals and other supplies close to home so you're not going out in that rural area and having unnecessary contact with people in a spot where the health care system can't really handle COVID-19 cases. People have been acting strangely lately. Animals, too. We have picture proof of both. And your feedback next. most Colorado thing we saw today is story time on the range. Cows generally are not considered to be the smartest animals. Uh, goats a bit more intelligent. I wonder, however, if we might improve the situation by reading to them like they're doing at the Twin Lakes Ranch. Patty, whose dad runs that homestead north of Boulder, saw a viral post about a, a little girl reading to a calf. So she got the family to do the same. She told us there's nothing wrong with having a little fun at the ranch during the pandemic. 
Feedback by text tonight on our lead story about a death that might have been overcounted as COVID-19. The text says the hospitals receive more money if they claim it's a COVID death. We should note that the patient in our story tonight never treated at a hospital, so that doesn't hold up. Tyler asked us how often overcounting happens. That is a good question, and it's one that we're going to keep asking. Pam offers another perspective, saying the man may not have died of COVID, but if not counted as positive, then no contact tracing. Remove the designation that endangers others. And a final piece of feedback that my pocket square needs to be dark blue or dark purple. Doesn't look good. Apologies. We'll see you next time.